Hey, my name is Eric, and I just want to thank you for joining us today. You have come to the right place. We want to encourage you. Would you take just a quick second? Would you share this link with a friend, with a family member, someone who you know might need this this morning? Come on, you never know whose life might be changed. Hey, and we're about to get into worship together. Come on, so let's stand up. Let's get ready. Let's get in a posture of praise, and let's get ready to give God all that we have.
worship you. Come on, you are here. You are here, right here, working in this place. Oh, we worship. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, you are. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you, oh you are, you are here, you're working in this place, and I worship you, I worship you, now you are the way make, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Yes, he is. We sing. Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Come on, sing, touch.
Hey, Cause Church, want to welcome you once again to this online worship experience. I feel like I might be biased, but I think we have the best worship team on the planet. What a time we've already had in the presence of God. We're just praying. We're believing that you just feel encouraged, that your faith feels built right there in your living room or wherever you might be tuning in to this worship experience from. And we want to welcome you to the Cause Church. It might be a little bit of a different season. But that doesn't mean we have to be any less connected. There's several ways you can continue to be connected with the church family. We're just so glad that you're here today with us. Absolutely. And after the sermon, we're going to have some chat time. We're going to still be in the chat room, being able to talk with each other. And I'd encourage you, if you have a prayer request that you would like the church to be praying for, please put that in there. We want to stand with you. We want to believe with you. And if you have something private that you don't feel like sharing with the whole church, that's absolutely fine too. Go to our website, send us an email. We would love the opportunity to be able to pray for you. And also, if you have not been joining us, Our Cause Kids has been amazing. They're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they are posting sermons for the kids, they have activities, they have coloring sheets. So I'd encourage you, if you have not yet done that, please do because your kids will be blessed. We wanna be a church that really reaches generations and you do not wanna miss out. Absolutely, so you can follow the Cause Kids on Instagram, Mm -hmm. you can get on the website, thecausecda.com, find all that amazing content. And hey, church family, we want to thank you for your continued generosity. During this season, it means the world to us that you're enabling us as a church and as a ministry to continue to encourage, to continue to reach. We reached so many people with the good news last weekend. Today, right now, as you share this link, we continue to reach, continue to be a light in our city. If you've never given and you're ready to take that step, there's several ways you can do that today. You can do it. On our website, you can click one of the links that will be in Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, You can give on the app. You can even text to give. Want to make it as easy as possible. And we're believing, like for us as a couple and as a family, as we continue to give, uh, God continues to show up faithful in our lives. Hey, next week, 
Invite everybody, send it to everybody, make sure you're online. We're jumping into a brand new sermon series. Check out this title, Shut In But Never Shut Up. Come on, I feel like you need to be in church online next week. I believe that God's gonna speak to you. I can't wait to share what God's put on my heart. Now, this week, coming right up, I wanna introduce our dear friend, Anya. She planted the church with us. She, we sat down with her and we said, hey, we're planting a church. She said, I'm in. Mm-hmm. She is an amazing wife to our worship pastor, Eric. Mm-hmm. She's an amazing mom. Yep. And she's an amazing preacher. She's yes. got a word in season for you. So lean in with expectancy. Come on, let's hear a message from God today. Good morning, church. How is everyone doing this morning? I want to know, did you get ready for church or did you just roll out of bed? I can't hear you, it doesn't matter. As long as you're here, I am just so glad that you joined us this morning. I am grateful that even though we can't meet in person, we can at least meet online. And while we are counting down the days until we are under the same roof, I may never shake your hand again. I'm just excited that we can be together once more. I am excited, I'm honored to be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. He has been speaking to me challenging me and I know that with the times that we're in these interesting crazy uncertain times a lot of us are dealing with some heavy things and I felt so strongly that God wanted to remind us of some things today and the first thing that I need to remind you of is that there is a battle going on right now for you yes you I know some of you are looking around your living room right now saying who is she talking to there's like six of us in here I'm talking about you. You are so valuable and you are of such incredible worth that there's actually a fight over you. See, Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which He prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Hear me when I tell you today that when God made you, You weren't just cut from the same cloth as everyone else. You weren't some pattern replica, but God put so much thoughts and attention and detail into you, His workmanship. Everything that makes you, you, your personality, your giftings, all the little quirks, all of them were so on purpose and designed for you to be able to walk in the good works that He prepared for you. See, you have an incredible purpose on your life, a God-given purpose purpose. And for those of you who are like, are you really talking about me? Yes. And for those of you who are saying, that sounds great, but I'm too far gone. Even if I had a purpose, I'm not walking in it. I want to tell you, if you've got breath in your lungs, you are not too far gone. God has spoken promises over you, blessings over you, over your family, over your children and your children's children's children. And it's because of that purpose and those promises that there is a fight. And that fight is right here in your mind. You've got one side fighting to propel you into this God-given, God-intended life for you, full of freedom and joy and peace and hope and really all the things that you and I as human beings long for. But then you've got this other side that's battling to stop that and to get you trapped into a life of despair, of hopelessness, of fear, of shame. And I want to tell you that this battle that goes on, it is real. And sometimes that tension is constant, but especially in the times that we're in right now. And this battle for your mind is so powerful because your mind is so powerful. It dictates a lot about your future. Proverbs 4.20 says this, carefully guard your thoughts because they are the source of true life. Carefully guard your thoughts because they are the source of true life. To me, this verse doesn't just highlight the influence our thoughts have over our lives, but it highlights the influence that we have over our thoughts. And that is exactly what I want to talk to you about today. And so if you're taking notes, I've titled this message, Believe It or Not. Believe it or not. Would you pray with me? God, we just love you. And we thank you that you are here with us wherever we are, you are there. And I want to just commit 
this morning to you, God, as we seek after you, as we get into your word, God, would you speak to us? Would you illuminate things in our lives that you are wanting to challenge or to change or to improve? God, in every single distraction that is going to come against our mind today, because it will, we silence it in the name of Jesus. And God, we ask right now for your will to be done. We are ready. Would you speak? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I want to tell you guys a story. This story actually happened to me almost 20 years ago, but I remember it, every detail of it, like it happened yesterday. I was about 17 years old. Don't try to figure out my age. It wasn't exactly 20 years, but I was about 17 years old, and I was working at this coffee shop. It was like a kiosk in the middle of a shopping center, like a mall. And I remember that day. It was in January. It was hot outside, and there were people everywhere. Right across from my coffee stand was this big department store called Big W. Maybe it's like a Target. And it was having a crazy sale. They even had tables out in the middle of the shopping center lobby. Maybe we'll call it that. So it was just people everywhere. And I remember I was standing there and I was taking people's coffee orders. I had another girl working on the other end of the kiosk making coffees and I was taking orders. And I'm order after order. The line was long and I just noticed this bustle of people all around. But yet out of the corner of my eye, I spotted this man, and he wasn't going with the crowd or moving or anything. He was sort of standing there, kind of watching us. And I'm like, that's weird. But I was so busy. There were so many people. I just kept taking um, coffee orders. I remember about 30 minutes later, I look up, and I'm like, oh, he's still there, and he's still watching us. I started to think, you're a bit of a creeper. So I'm like, okay, I don't have time for you. So I say to my friend, hey, let's switch. You take orders, and I'll make the coffee, because I knew there was a column, and I knew that if I moved, this guy wouldn't be able to see me anymore, and he'd probably just leave. I went to, It was so busy that day. So we swap. I start making coffee. I'm like, good, and I look up, and my heart sunk into my stomach as the guy had moved and now was standing directly in front of me, a couple of feet away, but staring. He wasn't watching us. He was staring at me, and fear gripped me like... This wasn't just a normal person. This was a Creeperville times a thousand. And he had his eyes fixed. And at first I was like, you can't do that. I'm going to stare you down, buddy. Every time I looked at him, his presence felt so overwhelming that I just looked away. And I was scared. You know when fear kind of grips you and you can't really move or do anything? That's what happened. And instantly I thought, don't tell anyone. You can't tell anyone you have a stalker. He's going to watch you. So I didn't say anything. There were people around me. The girl I was working with, we had the shopping center security guys walking by saying good morning. And I was, one, so angry at them for not doing their job. But two, so confused that in the middle of this busy shopping center, this guy was able to just be a creeper staring at me and no one did anything about it. And so every time I moved, this went on for about four hours, every time I moved from one end of the kiosk to the other, he moved with me. And every moment, I started to get gripped with more and more fear, thinking, what's going to happen? And I became resigned to the fact that this guy was after, he was bad, it was bad news, and the fact that I was closing that kiosk by myself that night in my car, was parked underground, there was going to be no one around, and I had to go down there by myself, and that right there was going to be the end of my life. I'm not even joking, I thought it's come down to this. And so I remember thinking, what can I do to put up a fight? I'm definitely not going to go look. I'm definitely not going to call the police or tell my friend. And I'm definitely not going to go up to him. But maybe if I write down a description of what he's wearing, I can leave it as evidence for the police to find. And maybe he won't get away with whatever he's going to do. This is a real conversation that I'm having in my head over the period of about four hours. So I start to look at this guy and take note of what he's wearing. And at first, I look at his, he's got long, dark hair, pulled back. His presence is just dark. And then I get down, he's wearing this long leather trench coat and what looks like a samurai sword. We don't have samurai swords in Australia, but something was strapped to his back. Get down to his big, fat, ugly army combat boots. And suddenly I noticed something. Right there at the bottom of his feet was a sign. It said, Lord of the Rings. It was a cardboard cutout of Argon from Lord of the Rings. I still remember that feeling of relief that gripped me when I was like, am I going to make it? 
Is this not the end of my life? I finally felt the freedom to say to the girl, there has been a guy that's been... St- I thought that guy was stalking me, but it's a cardboard cutout. And she lost it. She starts telling all the customers that are coming through, I didn't thought she was being stalked by a cardboard cutout. The security guys decided to show up. She tells them. I wasn't happy with I was mad at them because they weren't doing their good job anyway. But I remember thinking feeling the relief by not believing it until I actually went up to that thing, like kicked it and be like, you are not real. You are not real. But what was interesting was Big W, that store, was having a DVD sale. And when I got to the cardboard cutter, I noticed there was actually three of them perfectly positioned behind that pillar. So wherever I moved, the angle was just right to have me convinced my life was about to end. And so I don't know about you, but have you ever allowed your mind to go to such a crazy place like that? I mean, obviously none of you would allow it to go that crazy, I get it. But for me, this story was such a critical life lesson. It was also a cardboard cut and I'm not yet over it, but it was a critical life lesson of how I spent four hours of my life absolutely terrorized by a piece of cardboard. You guys, you can't make this stuff up. I lost all reasoning skills. Like, why on earth would I not just tell someone? What's he going to do in the middle of a crowded shopping center? But I couldn't. Why on earth would I start considering going down to that parking lot by myself? It's funny, I now have a lot of more grace for those people in horror movies who when the guy's coming in and they run up to the attic and we all get mad at them. I kind of can relate to that now. But that's the thing though. That's the power of your mind. Your thoughts And the things that you think and in your mind, it influences everything. Everything that you do, every word that you speak is first a thought in your mind. You think it, then you say it. You think it, then you act on it. And as we read earlier, how you think determines not just the quality of your life, but also the type of person that you are. See, Proverbs tells us that as a man thinks, so he is. And you know what that means? The truth about a person lies within how they think. And the truth about you lies within how you think. I've heard it say, where the mind goes, the man follows. And so guard your thoughts because they are the source of true life. I really am fascinated by this topic. I think it's because I'm such a thinker. My mind gets crazy creative if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> Do you know that you estimate up to, it's estimated that you think up to 30 thousand thoughts a day. They flood our minds from different places, but I believe that our thought life is more connected to our spiritual life than we tend to realize. And that's because our mind is the place that we most often connect with God. Think about it. He can speak to us in many different ways, and he does, but most often he speaks to us at the level of thought. The issue with that is that we also have a very real enemy whose goal in life is to come against everything that God says. So while God's speaking to us at the level of thought, the enemy is attacking us at the level of thought also. So you've got one side, God, and you, have, and you have the enemy, the other side. And have you noticed how this is battle and this mental tug of war? You can go from feeling good one minute then com- to completely anxious the next and vice versa and to think all it took for such a change in emotion is a thought. Maybe you read a headline, maybe you received a text, maybe you saw a stat, but all it took was one moment for everything to change, and it was all because you caught a thought. Have you ever caught a thought that's made you go, whoa, where did that come from? You see, that's actually a great question that needs to be asked, because every thought that you think comes from somewhere And it's important to know where it comes from because where it comes from will determine where it's leading to. And I got this analogy of thoughts being like a cross-country express train. Train of thought, it doesn't matter. These trains do not stop for anything until they reach their destination. It's a fast track, so once you're on it, you're on it. So you want to make sure that before you get on that train, doesn't matter how nice the train is, doesn't matter, matter whether it's a full service train with full recliner chairs. Doesn't matter how beautiful the view is. You have to know where that train's taking you to because you might like the ride but hate the destination. And it's the same way with our thoughts. All of our thoughts are going to take us somewhere. And so before you indulge that thought, 
you better know where it's coming from. Because if it's not coming from God, it doesn't matter how comfortable that thought is, it's going to take you somewhere you do not want to be. Our thought life influences everything. But here's something that we need to remember and that we forget all the time. You can actually control your thoughts. It's called free will, and God gave it to all of us. It's the ability to make a choice of what or who we're going to listen to, and then subsequently, what or who we're going to believe. I heard someone say one time that thoughts are like birds. You can't stop them from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest on it. So you do not have to accept every single thought that comes to your mind. But so often we do, and we do it without even a fight. Fear comes knocking on the door one day, we open it, we say, oh, hey, hey, fear, you're here to ruin my life? Oh, no problems. Come on in. It's not supposed to be that way. Instead of taking our thoughts captive and bringing them under obedience to Jesus Christ, they take us captive and bring us under obedience to fear or anxiety or shame or guilt or whatever it is, and it's not supposed to be that way, and I am getting convicted of this even now. It is not supposed to be that way. Scripture tells us, 2 Corinthians 10.5, and I want you to hear this. You've heard it before, but I need to remind you that we, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ, and we take captive every thought, and we make that thing obedient to Christ Jesus. Come on now. Those are fighting words, which makes sense, because we're in a fight. And when it comes to this fight, this battle for our minds, there is something that we need to be aware of. The enemy's number one agenda is as simple as this. He does not want you to believe God. He doesn't want you to believe God, and he will do whatever it takes to convince you that God can't be trusted and that his word isn't true. See, this has always been his agenda. We see it all the way back in Genesis. And I, like you, have read the story of Adam and Eve millions of times, but recently God highlighted me something in that story highlighted different to me than when I usually read it, and I want to read it to you. So starting in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. And there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of the good and evil. Skipping right down to verse 15, it says, The Lord God took man and put him in the garden to work and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. I want to just take a second before continuing to debrief what just happened here because it really speaks volumes to the character and the nature of God. See, when God had just gotten done creating the world, heavens, the earth, animals, light, and it was perfect and it was wonderful. And he then proceeded to make man. And how he did it was absolutely spectacular. He took nothing and made it into something. The dust of the earth from dust into man into someone made for a relationship with him made with a God-ordained purpose in mind. Maybe sounds familiar? That home that he made for Adam was Eden and it was breathtaking. Think about the most exquisite place that you've ever seen. It was like that, but a thousand times more glorious. And in that garden, God in his goodness and in his generosity gave to Adam everything that he could ever need. Food, purpose, beauty, companionship. And God gave him complete freedom except there was this one restriction. Adam, you can eat anything from any of these trees except you can't eat from that tree. See, when God tells you no, when he's seemingly withholding something from you, it is never to deprive you of something good. God only gives good gifts and oftentimes his no is his protection. You see right here, and I've seen it in my own life, and maybe you can look back on your life and see where God has said no. It was really for your good. 
and you didn't recognize it then, but now you recognize it because he's no, while it may seem harsh at the time, if you know who God is and you believe that he is good, you truly believe it and you believe that he's sovereign and that he wants the best for you, then you can trust his no. It's just too often we don't. And so with that, let's keep reading Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that's in the midst, neither shall you touch it. Take note of that, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like him, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then both of their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked and so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. See, I've always always struggled with this story because it blows my mind how someone who was so close to God, she had walked with him, she had talked with him, she knew him, but yet after one conversation, she could doubt him so easily. It says that she looked at the tree and it was a delight to her eye that she desired it. How could she have seen goodness and beauty in the very thing that God told her would kill her? But then I remembered, I've done that too. I've always read Genesis 3 in the light of sin and how sin entered the world. But as I study this, I see that the issue here wasn't her sin as much as it was her unbelief. Don't get me wrong, sin is a huge issue and God hates it. And he hates it because it actually keeps us from him. We were never created or designed to be apart from God, but that's what sin does. But in Genesis 3, we can see that before sin came unbelief, and we can in turn see that the root of every sin, the root of all sin, is unbelief. And if you dig a little deep into the areas of life where you struggle, you'll discover that at the very core of it is unbelief. Unbelief in the word and in the person of God. But remember the enemy's agenda. His prize in this battle is your belief. And I'm not talking today to people who don't know God, who don't believe in him. I'm talking to those of us who know God. We've experienced the reality of God in our lives, yet we still have these moments of unbelief. Did God actually say, I know what the Bible says about sin, but does it really mean that? I mean, if it's just a look, if I just look and I don't do anything, is it really that bad? I know what the Bible says about God's sovereignty, but I'm looking around here and things feel pretty out of control. Am I sure God's really in control? I know what the Bible says about he's my provider, but is he really going to come through for me this month? I might just hang on to this a little bit longer just in case. In this battle, there is a temptation and there is a choice. Am I going to believe God or not? You see, with Eve... She started to believe not just the words of the enemy, but also her own feelings. Her faith went from being in God to being in how she felt. And when our thoughts or our feelings or anything starts telling us something contrary to the word of God, that is the time to stop, double check, and ask yourself, where is this coming from? Because just because it feels good doesn't mean that it is good. And we find ourselves caught in the middle of this tension between is it God, is it not God? And I want to say it is scarily easy to give into the things that God tells us to stay away from. I mean, just look at Eve, but also look at you. See, God puts boundaries on us. In his word, you can see the do's and don'ts of life. And a lot of people don't like that. They feel like God's being too restrictive. But those restrictions are just his protection. And just like he told Adam, don't eat eat the fruit. It'll ruin your life. He tells us similar things, not because he's mean, but because he's good. He's a good father that just wants to warn his kids about things that will hurt them and keep them from the abundant life that he made for them to live in. And so God will say things like, don't live in fear. It's going to ruin your life. He'll say, don't give in to sin. It's going to literally ruin your life. Don't live in unforgiveness. It'll ruin your life. But when he says that, and when we read it, 
Do we believe it? Why I, I battle with this idea of why it's so easy to believe lies over truth, even for Christians, Christians who have walked with God a long time. Well, I need to remind you, and I need to remind myself constantly, it's because there's a battle both in your mind and for your mind. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a fight with your spouse? I haven't. But I'm thinking, baby, when someone else makes you angry, why is it easy to stay angry at them than it is to stop right there on the spot and apologize and reconcile? The Bible is clear. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. We've all heard it at every single wedding we've ever been to. We understand the magnitude and the effects that anger has on our life. Don't stay in that place. It will destroy you both mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. It's damaging yet. In that moment, when that thought comes to your mind, it usually feels pretty good. And maybe this sounds familiar. You'll say something like this, wow, I cannot believe he did that. I am so angry. And then that thought starts to go somewhere. It starts to get a little bit of traction, so you start to engage in this like inner dialogue. It's like, yeah, they're the worst. Let's think about everything else that they've done so we can just really get to the bottom of it. Well, Five months ago, he did this. He did? Oh, he doesn't even deserve your forgiveness. Well, I'm not going to forgive him. Heck, I'm not even going to talk to him. And it's crazy because you get to this place where you know that's only going to lead to devastation and misunderstanding on both sides, but yet you allow yourself to go there. You've jumped on this train and before you know it, you're going for a ride. And that ride might have felt good at the start, but the destination sucked. And it was because you chose to believe something was good, even though God told you it wasn't. And the more you think about something, the more you believe it, and the more you believe it, the harder it is to break. Have you ever gotten stuck while you're driving? Have you ever gotten your car stuck in the snow? I know I've got my car stuck in the snow. I've gotten it stuck on, in rocks. I one time got it stuck on the edge of a cliff where like the back tire was hanging off. I just moved to Idaho and it wasn't necessarily a cliff, but it was a really steep driveway. It doesn't matter how you think about my driving. The point is I have gotten my car stuck. And every time that I have, I've tried that maneuver, like that back and forth maneuver, trying to like build, I don't know, build momentum. It's funny, it never has worked. It's only created this deeper indent into the road so I find myself just stuck even more. It's funny, the same thing happens with our thought lives. Like I'm not a neuroscientist or anything like that, but it's interesting. Science actually shows us that when you think something over and over and over again, it actually creates a physical and visible change in your brain. Your brain can actually develop ruts, indents, just like with a car. The more we go over and over the same thing, the more we think and think and think the same thought, the deeper that rut gets in your physical brain and the harder it is to break that thought pattern. I believe it's the reason why God talks so much about meditating on scripture, why he tells us we need to renew our mind. We need to dwell on the things that are good and pure. God knows more than anyone the power of the mind and either the, de- either the destructiveness or the constructiveness of our thinking. And so as I get ready to wrap this up, there are a couple of things that I noticed in the story of Eve in Genesis 3. Weak spots in her life that I believe made her vulnerable to attack. And as if I'm telling you these, you recognize these things in your own life. It means that you're vulnerable to attack too. But it also means that you can now be aware and reverse those weak spots. And so that when the battle comes at you and the battle rages and the thoughts start to attack, you'll be better prepared to take them before they take you. The first thing I'll note is the question that the serpent said to Eve. He said this, did God really say you can't eat the fruit in the garden? First off, The enemy is a deceptive, lying liar. He knew very well what God had said. The problem was Eve didn't. If you read her response, she quotes something that God actually didn't say. It was kind of close and it sounded right. But when you have just a kind of an understanding of God's word, when you just sort of know it, it makes you more vulnerable. Eve actually made that serpent's job easier. He didn't have to work to try to get her to doubt God's word. 
she didn't know it in the first place. Listen to the scripture, Ephesians 6.13, it says this, Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon that God has issued, so that when this is all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, um, all of these are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's Word is an indispensable weapon. God's Word is an indispensable weapon. When it comes to the battle of a mind, there is nothing more powerful than the Word of God. Some of us have more time today than we've ever had. Let's use that time instead of filling it up with things that don't matter. Take the time to pick up this book, read it, memorize it, feed your spirits, strengthen yourself, build your faith. And that, all of that comes from reading and knowing the Word of God. The second thing that I noticed, and it was only because I actually picked up a concordance and kind of went into the original language of the text, but when the snake came to Eve and asked, did God really say? The word he used for God was Elohim. Now, Elohim is used when speaking not just of God, the true God, but also of false gods. It's like a general term for God. And in Eve's reply, she too used the word Elohim instead of using his true name, Yahweh. This speaks to the fact that Eve did not fear God. Throughout Scripture, we're shown the significance of His name, that it's holy and that it's to be revered. And one of the reasons it's good to fear God is because fear keeps fear of God keeps you from sin. Exodus 20, 20 says this, Moses was talking to the Israelites and he said, don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. Proverbs tells us to fear God is to hate evil. If ever Eve needed the fear of God, it was in that moment, it was that day, that conversation, but she didn't have it. The fear of God, friends, protects us from sin. And I'm not talking about just sin in the terms of the wrong kind of action, but I'm talking about sin in terms of the wrong type of thinking. And now the last thing I noticed was that during the conversation with Eve, during the conversation with the, with the snake, Eve was by herself. The scripture isn't completely clear on where Adam was, but I wonder, had he been there, could he have helped her? Because isolation is never a good thing. It's in our moments of weakness that we need people the most. God himself said, it's not good for man to be alone. We need one another. We need people around us, people who are stronger than us, people who can come alongside and lift us up when we're weak, who can encourage us when we're struggling. It's pretty ironic considering that we've all been isolating for the last, I don't even know, I've been isolating for five weeks. And I'm telling you, it's enough for the, even the strongest among us to go mad. But we need community now more than ever. We all struggle with our thought life, especially in this time that we're facing together. What's going on now is the perfect opportunity for our minds to be attacked. And so our need for community is real and it is urgent and it's available though. It is available to us. We have it right here within our own church family. Just because we're not meeting here physically once a week doesn't mean that church is no longer the church. Our community is strong. And while our way of connecting looks a little bit different, it's still there. You know, we have, instead of you shouting your preacher down, maybe you're using those emojis in the comments there to express your amens. Instead of meeting together in groups and homes, we have virtual connect groups going on that have been amazing. We have online watch parties hosted by people in our church for these Sunday gatherings. Our pastors host prayer sessions online. Our teams are meeting up via Zoom, catching up, still strategizing, still doing the work that they've always done. Cause kids have gotten creative to ensure the little ones don't get lost in this mess. My four-year-old, his social life is busier than it's ever been, all because cause kids are reaching out. Isolation does not have to be your lot in life, friends. Not right now. Pick up your phone. Call someone. Reach out. If you hated social media before, now's the time to see the good in it. Allow people to come alongside you, to encourage you when you're weak, and to challenge you when you need it. You see, we all need one another. And I'm thinking right now, if you're listening to this message and you're thinking, yeah, I'm being attacked my thought life is all over the place. I don't know what to believe, what not to believe. I want to tell you something, friend. You're not alone. 
it's common for our thoughts. We're in a battle. The battle's for our mind, but remember, the battle's also for our belief. When it comes to, are we gonna believe God or not? It really does come down to a choice. You have to make that choice for yourself, but He's given you these tools to help you get straight the Word of God. The Word of God is your ultimate weapon. I've said it before. Community. Community will come alongside you when you're struggling to make the right choice, when you're struggling to know what to believe. Community is what you need. And we're going to have a time later on after this online worship experience where you can jump online, ask for prayer, chat to someone. We want to be here for you. But maybe you're here today and you're not part of the Cause Church. Maybe you just randomly found us online. I want to tell you something. First of all, it wasn't random. Second of all, we're glad you're here. But maybe you don't know God. You don't believe in God. You've never experienced God for yourself. I want to tell you something. Life in Jesus is better than anything that you can imagine because at the end of the day, we are, as Christians and believers, we're left with a hope that the world doesn't have. I know in this time of isolation, I had this one day where I was completely overcome with the feeling of hopelessness. I don't remember quite what happened. My mind was obviously going crazy. Thoughts were attacking, but I remember feeling this sense of hopelessness and it was so heavy and so overwhelming that I thought, I never want to feel like this again. Obviously, God came through and prayed. It was fine. It was gone. I had my hope back. I've always got my hope, but I feel like God gave me some insight into what people who don't know Him must be feeling. And if that's you, if you're like, yeah, I've got that burden. I've got the hopelessness. Things are out of control. I'm uncertain. I'm afraid. I want to tell you something. I want to give you an opportunity today. You can know God right now. I'd be honored to pray a prayer with you. And if you want to follow along in your heart, say it out loud. Join with me now, God. I thank you for every single person that's listening right now, God, and for those who want to know you yet don't. God, I pray that you would bless them in this moment, that you would reveal yourself to them, Lord God, as they take that step in making that choice to, I am now going to believe in God. I'm going to leave my old life and I'm going to turn to God. God, we believe and we declare that their name is now written in your book, God. And because of that, they have hope of eternity with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, We are so stoked. You have an army of people who are cheering you on right now. So proud and so glad that you just made the best decision of your life. And if you did, we've got some next steps for you right now. You can go to our website www.thecoursecda.com. It's weird. It's different to what it's usually happened, but we're not going to let people fall through the cracks. We're going to make a way for them to find their next steps. Go to the website and on that homepage, it'll say new to Jesus. Click on that button and that's going to take you through your next steps. Or maybe you're listening and you're thinking, I am not feeling connected. I want to get connected. I want to know more about church or I just want to maybe learn about groups or how I can get more involved. We've also got a next step for you. Again, on our website, go to in the top right-hand corner, there's a little button that says connect. That's going to take you through your next steps. And if 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 this message maybe resonated with you today and you're thinking, I would love some prayer. I am struggling and I need someone to come alongside We also have a next step for you. Again, on our website, there's a button that says need prayer. Click on that. We'll keep it confidential if you need it, but we would absolutely love to pray with you. We are in this together. And so Cause Church, we love you. Stay around. We're going to leave the chat open for a bit. We'd love to connect. We'd love to talk. We'd love to catch up. But until next week, have a good week. We love you. Hey, thanks so much for watching today. Pray you encouraged, pray you were built up in your faith. If you haven't already, take a moment, subscribe on YouTube, make sure and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Keep up with us, get all the latest content. And hey, if you're brand new to Jesus today, if you're saying yes to Jesus, or maybe you've been part of the church and you're ready to take your next step, wanna make sure that you have all the tools you need. Go right to the causecda.com There's a button there where you can say, I'm new to Jesus. We want to help you with several next steps you can take. Or you can also click on the connect button right there on the homepage. And you can let us know, hey, I want to get connected. I want to be part of a virtual group or I want to be on a serve team. I love you, Cause Church. Can't wait to see you soon.